Okay, so welcome to Partial Differential Equations Lecture 4. Today we're going to start going on with our discussion of shock waves. So just a reminder of what we did yesterday. We looked at Berger's solution, um, which is basically a solution to this equation. It's a non-linear equation. We used the method of characteristics with this Cauchy curve um, to find the parametric solution. So here's our cal initial conditions. Here's the equations that we were solving. And as I said, be careful of the z because implicitly is a function of time. So you have to solve these two that you can solve easily first, subject to those initial conditions. And here they are, the solutions. Z is just a constant then. And once you have that, you can integrate this one subject to that initial condition. And that's how we got this. Okay? And that Z is basically H of S. So it's a full parametric solution. And we said we then eliminated S and T using these first two um, expressions, and we found that U obeyed the implicit equation like this. And then we went on and we said um, we could work out the characteristic projection, Cs, which is merely these purple lines, the characteristic lines is x, y component. And we found that because the derivative here of h is negative, the lines that have high velocity tend to collide in with the ones that have low velocity. And we worked out the criterion for the lowest y value, in other words, lowest time value at which this actually occurs. And physically, this corresponds to a breaking, a breaking wave. Okay, and formally, the solutions break, or the continuous one property of the solutions break down, but you can still say things about the solutions, and that's what we're basically going to do today. Okay. So here we are. It's just, again, to show you, uh, this is the initial condition. Because it's a nonlinear equation, the things with higher speed travel or a higher amplitude initially travel faster, and you can see the typical wave that breaks. And there, actually, if you look at it very carefully, you draw a vertical line, you'll see that it is actually bent over. And what did I do? Sorry. OK. So after that point where that um, shock has formed the first time, no continuous one solution exists, um, and the solution becomes multivalued, and shocks form, okay? And there's a very easy way to, do, to deal with this, or rather a very straightforward way to deal with this, with this, and that's necessary because they actually form in all types of nonlinear PDEs. It's not that shocks are a surprise. In fact, you should get a surprise if you have a nonlinear PDE that doesn't form a shock, okay? And there are examples, and they're very rare, and you, you keep them. So the, the basic assumption is that the solutions you find are at some point going to form a shock, but you still can work locally with initial conditions and then um, find out as much as you can, but it's only valid for a small region or a region around the, um, around the initial condition itself until the shocks form or the characteristics collide. And so what we're going to do a little bit today is to define what we call a weak solution. And what a weak solution is, it's not C infinity, there's a jump, and the jump occurs at the shock front, okay? And it basically means you stitch together two completely fine solutions, and then with the exception at the shock, right? So you sort of have this situation, and this is just a caricature, but it's a real problem that I'll discuss next. It's simply, suppose here you have a solution with initial condition that U is larger uh, than the um, initial condition over here, you'll find that these two things collide along this red line, which is what we call a shock front. And there are actually quite a lot of work being done because it's so ubiquitous in partial differential equations. Typically, you don't have anything else. I mean, you have one solution that comes from the one characteristics, another solution that comes from the other set of characteristics, and then the only place you run into trouble is at the shock front, and you can prove that. So generally, your shock fronts are, both in mathematics, they viewed as being um, infinitely small. Okay, They basically approach a line. Um, but in physics as well, um, most shock fronts are actually tiny, like the 
the shot front in the front of an explosion is tiny. The shot front in front of those airplanes, and I'll show you a few pictures at the end, um, they also literally approach your mathematical line. Okay. And you can actually study these shock fronts. So if you just look at this picture, you can see one, it has a definite position. So you can actually view it as a parameterized curve, which is what we'll do to describe it. And two, um, it actually has a speed, right? It travels. So the shock front, this particular example, shock front starts here at zero, and then it travels with a particular speed in that direction. And that speed is different from, in some sense, the characteristic slope. Okay, this is a very simplified example to illustrate it, um, to illustrate the situation because the shock front is straight. It need not be straight. A lot of shock fronts are actually circular. They tend to become, actually depend on dimensionality. Um, they tend to become circular in many cases, with, which we study in three dimensions. Um, and in two dimensions, they're more likely. They can be straight as well. And so just to sort of make the thing clear, full, uh, sort of complete, this type of solution you could get, for example, if you had chosen HX in our, as our initial, oh, what's happening? Um, if you chosen HX in our initial condition to be the step function, okay? So there you are. So this is exactly what you can imagine. If you chosen HX to basically be the step function, you would have a high value of u over there, which would increase the slopes because it's one over the value that gives you the slopes. And then you'd have a lower speed um, for positive x values, so this would in, uh, illustrate that. Okay, so this is an example where you can still find the solution, but your initial condition h of x is discontinuous. So all the theorems that we've worked out for existence doesn't strictly hold at the point only. They're still valid, except at the point x equals to zero. And that x x to zero then pro propagates along the shock front. Okay, so you can still stitch together a solution. So that's effectively when you put it on a numerical grid, you effectively work in regions where the solution is valid. Um, and then what the the codes that do shock front tracking actually do, they simply they're still stitching together um, the two exactly exact continuous solutions, and then over the shock front, and this is exactly what we're going to do, is they write down the conditions that the solution, the integrated version of the solution is exactly satisfied. Okay, so it's still solving the solution, but it's doing it on average over a, a region that lies on both sides of the shock front. And that's, that typically they use, to do that, they simply use a conservation law. So instead of viewing the equations as a differential equation, they integrate over a small region and make sure that on average the differential equation is satisfied. So the way they work out these conditions are very rigorous, and I'll show you two ex well, basically an example for this case and then the more generalized version for the Burgers equation. Okay, so let's look at the shock speed. Um, and that's basically trying to determine the slope of this line. And let's look at the particular case where we've chosen the simplified initial condition, and then I will then generalize it to a general initial condition later on, once you have the sort of ideas. So firstly, let's H of S, our initial condition, be basically a value U left, which is larger than U right, because if it's less, then you're not going to have a shock front. Um, and, okay, so that's basically the step function. I haven't defined it at u0, you can, sorry, at s equals to 0, you can, but it yeah, adds little to the discussion. Um, and we assume your left is greater than your right, okay? And then I'm going to claim that the solution is simply a step function that propagates. Okay, I've not derived that, but you can implicitly see that because the solution is constant along the characteristics over here, everything along these characteristics will simply propagate along the fact that the value of the function is u left, and everything along these characteristics will propagate along the fact that the function is u right, and so the only thing that's going to change is where the switch takes place. Okay, and so that's why I said the solution is this thing. So I'm basically stitching together the two valid solutions on each side of the shock, 
and the thing that I'm leaving uncertain is basically the position of the shock. Okay. And this C is a constant um, which we're going to determine. Okay, and that's known as the shock speed. And so I'm going to give the argument for determining C, and then in the next couple of slides I'll generalize it for a thing that will solve, that will be, can be used for any initial condition of Burgers and a larger class of e equations. Okay. Okay, so the way we determine the shock front, and this is the same method we're going to use again, is suppose you have a large constant M. In other words, suppose you have M that's very far out here and minus M that's very far out there, so it's away from the shock. And let's then integrate the equation up here, which is Berger's equation, but it's written in that form that I said was the divergence form where you have a derivative over here. And typically it's easy to find the shock speeds for equations that you can write in this form because you'll see the techniques that I use. Um, so for a large M, we now want to integrate that equation, basically both sides of it, from minus M to M. So at minus M, we know the thing is constant, so we know exactly what the function value is. At M, we also know exactly what the function value is, and the shock lies somewhere in between. Um, and so we simply use that equation, and over here, and now you can see why we wrote it in divergence form. Okay, this is a complete derivative that we can then evaluate. Okay, so the first thing that we do is here on the left-hand side, because it's the derivative with respect to y, um, we can take it out. Okay, so it's, and well, it's the derivative with respect to y, and the boundaries are constants. Otherwise, you would have had to add a term, which is what we're going to do in the next example. And so there you have that side. So this is basically ddy, which is a, how the function is basically changing as a function of time. So y can be viewed as our time variable. Um, so it's sort of the average, the, the integrated va uh, a magnitude of the function changes with time. And that simply equals to the exact differential evaluated. Okay, So you know at minus m it is minus minus, so you have ul squared minus ur squared. Okay, And so the next step is to note that that integral that we're trying to differentiate with time, we in this simplified example we can actually get analytically um, because we know that it is simply the area f from M to the line, which is basically X equals to CY, um, times the, the magnitude, the amplitude of the function, which is basically UL, plus the area under the part of the function which is smaller, which is M minus CY, because you've now moved over there, um, times UR. Okay? So we know what it is. And so when we differentiate this thing, we simply can lose the constant terms and you're left with something we, that's multiplied by the speed um, equals to something you know. So you can actually determine what the speed is. Okay, so um, there we have it. The speed is this. You can simplify it further. And it's all of what you expect. The shock front sort of travels at the average of the two speeds of the two different solutions. Okay. So that's an introduction to what shock fronts do. We now want to get a case where we actually can solve it for all type of initial conditions and in fact generalize it for solutions beyond Berger's equation. Um, shocks are always tricky to deal with or, well, tricky in the sense that you want to find the equation in a manner that you, it's easy to deal with these average things. And so the main focus of the shocks is not in this course because I, don't, I actually don't want to do it, but I do want to give you the example so that you know what's there and you know how to start looking for it and you know sort of the names of the main theorems that deal with it if ever you come across it. Um, so what we're going to do is look at weak solutions, and by weak solutions I basically mean these two solutions that are entirely valid, where the characters don't collide, they ca excuse me, propagate along char the characteristics, but then at the characteristics they're weak in the sense that they don't satisfy the equations 
in a continuous way, that, but they satisfy them on average. And to look at the weak equations, uh, the reason for looking at them is we try and extend the solution beyond that gradient catastrophe. And often we use divergence forms. So the form I'm going to give now is what makes this particular example possible, and it's valid for more than just Berger's equation. Okay? So if ever you have two functions of u, so remember u is a function of x and y, that obey this type of relationship. There exists an S and there exists an R such that you can write it in this way. Um, and they have the following thing that their functional dependence on U obeys this thing. Um, then it basically you can find a conservation law. Okay. So this is the class of all solutions that you can find a conservation law in this manner. You can deal with other equations that have shocks, that have conservation laws that you cannot find in this manner. So I'm simply looking at a subclass for example purposes. And you can see that Berger's equation fits into that, that thing and it will become apparent in the next, as I go on as well. Okay. And by conservation law, what I basically mean is pick an A and a B that are constant okay, and um, any y, then you can basically write this relationship holds, okay, and it comes simply by um, taking the derivative out in front of r, because a and b are constant, and the fact that ddx, um, this, that thing is, the second one is a complete integral, um, and you've integrated over x. So it's basically integrating equation 1 over x will result in this conservation law. And it's this thing that we're now going to use for Burgos theorem. So equations that have this property include Burgos theorem, but they're not exclusively Burgos um, equations. Okay. And now the shock conditions are what we're going to work out. They call it the... the Rancune, what's it? Rancune, you go. Can you do you know French? <laughs> anyway, uh, it's that shell condition. It's some physicists that actually worked it out. Well, physicists and mathematicians earlier on, there was not such a big difference, difference because they basically, yeah, they basically wanted to work out how the shock front um, moves. Um, and how it goes is, and it's just for this specific case now, there are more general ways of dealing with it. Um, suppose u is continuous one, solution of one, okay, in each of the two regions of the xy plane, um, it's, can be, the solution can be found, and then you have this specific curve that separates the two. So it separates the two regions where the characteristics are not colliding, okay, and the curve basically is that line that's formed by the envelope of co colliding characteristics. Um, okay, and there the U jumps, and I've hidden some of the details. There are theorems that you can rigorously prove that U jumps, and U jumps in this infinitesimal region across that line, which limits to zero in time. So the solutions are valid right up to the point. And that's finicky to prove, but it is there. Um, and what we're going to do is that denote the limits of u from the left and from the right by um, two different speeds. So that's simply for a given y, in other words, for a given time, u from the left and from the right has two different values. The theorems I have not taught you is basically those the limits that you can rigorously show that the limits are well-defined and that the jump occurs across this line. Okay, but that we just take for now because all we want to do is actually calculate, at least in this case, for the rest I like being rigorous. Um, and what you have now is you choose A and B, just as we did with that big M, to be far away from the shock front. Okay, so it's far away of the position of the shock for a particular Y. And then what we're going to do is simply use the theorem that we worked out from the fact that we're assuming we have a gradient form um, 
and uh, sort of work out the consequences. So the first part is ddy of the integral from a to b of r is ddy. Basically now we know that r in this case is a general function of u and we don't know what u is. So we can't just do the integral by taking out the, the constant bit. So what we do is we simply say it's the integral from a to c of r, which is implicitly a function of u, which is implicitly a function of both x and t. Um, and then the second part um, that goes from the boundary, from the shock to the other boundary, we know that independently these two integrals are well defined um, because it's just a uniform solution to the um, partial differential equations, which we can prove exists. And at the shock, it makes no difference, right, because it's an integral expression. So we split our integral into two bits. Um, and then what we have is simply that it is, if we work out what this integral, me or what the derivative of this integral is, because we're now taking a derivative with respect to y of, let's just say, the first term, what we have to do, and because the shock can potentially move, you have to take the derivative with respect to the boundary, or you have to take the value of the functional evaluated at the boundary times the derivative of the boundary. So that's just the definition of taking the derivative of an integral where you have a variable boundary. So that's the first term. So it's basically you are evaluated on the shock boundary um, times the C derivative, the derivative of the boundary position with respect to y the second part of the integral vanishes because it's constant. Okay, and then you put the derivative inside the integral and you basically have that you have d dy of r dx, okay, but you can then use this thing, okay, to replace d dy of r with um, minus ddx of s, which is what I've done over there. Okay, and that now you can once again evaluate at the boundaries because it's a complete differential. Um, and so you see why this is the necessary form to actually say anything in this case. So the second term is exactly the same, in fact. The only difference is you're taking the derivative of the boundary, but the boundary is the, the lower bound, so you have to add a minus. You have C prime R at UR, and then you add the second term that comes from the dy of R in that thing, and there we go. Okay, and you've replaced R with equation one to actually try and evaluate it. Questions here? Okay, clear. Um, good. Okay, so we now have that equation two further basically reduces it to um, this thing. Okay, so we have that here I've just factored this thing out. So C prime times R of UL minus this term over here, C prime times R of UR. So it's the function evaluated on the left bound and evaluated on the, the difference between the function of R evaluated on the left bound and the right bound, minus, okay, so this is just um, a ddx of S, so that is just S evaluated at you left and you right, okay. The thing I have omitted is strictly speaking you should have S evaluated in A and B. Okay, but I'm going to choose A and B large enough that it's away from the shock, and I'm also going to choose it large enough that we consider functions that actually go to zero and infinity. So I leave that bound away. It doesn't change um, with time. Okay, so that's so the boundary terms at S cancel, or they cancel because I've basically chosen the the initial condition to have compact support go to zero. And so what we're left with is the shock condition, okay? And you can see the shock condition over here, the C prime is how C is different, is a C derivative with respect to T. So it's basically the derivative 
of your boundary curve at the particular point. So it's the gradient. It gives you how the shock front is changing. And that, if your shock was a straight line, that would just have been C. Okay, so we've got now a shock condition that propagates the that, that determines the speed of propagation um, of the discontinuity. Okay, um, and what is interesting, and this is actually the property that you find in almost all shocks, the speed of the discontinuity um, is always related to the size of the jump. Okay. Um, in this case, it's made explicit. The other cases where it's, but it's a very good guess. Your first order guess, even if you can't solve the equations, can't do anything, it's always this condition that you guess at. And then you can go back and try and verify it and try and find the conservation laws, which aren't always that easy. But generally, uh, the rule of thumb, if you get a problem like this, the shock will always propagate at the size of the, as the size of the jump. So the, the bigger explosion you have, the bigger the discontinuity, say, in your temperature before and after the explosion, the faster the shock goes, which is logical, but it's just nice to see it come out rigorously. And there's actually a lot of people that did a lot of work on shock fronts, and I'll give you a few examples, the fascinating era-like um, discussion of what they can do. Okay. And so we've basically derived this condition um, that it's simply the speed of the shock if you are looking at equations that have this property, and Burgess equation does, for because we can choose R and S to be reasonably simple functions that um, does it. In fact, right, R is just U, and S is U squared times a, fa a function, and then you can just you, then that property of how it works. Okay, so that's how Burgess equations gets it. But our shock front is then entirely determined by this relationship. And it's true regardless of the actual shape of the shock, right? The shock will de depend at least initially on your initial conditions, right? So if you choose a, a step function, initially it will be a straight line. But if you chose that Gaussian, it's going to be like a curve. Um, and eventually it's going to asymptote to a straight line in this case. Okay, so examples of shock waves. I think this was one of the few pictures of the atomic test. If you looked at Beirut's explosion, um, it also had a shock wave. In fact, you had several, it's a fascinating thing to actually study. I haven't had time to go through the stuff, but there were several shock waves. The one was in the air. If you actually look at the videos of the explosion, you can see um, the water vapor, and that's the shock wave. It's sort of beautiful circular, it propagates at a certain speed. If you wanted to, estimate the amount of power that went into that shock wave. Because remember, the shock wave is just the magnitude of the discontinuity. There's basically one number that, is, that can describe your shock wave. And often it is the power of the initial explosion. And then it just goes. Um, so this is an example. It's also the thing that there's this famous story of when they did the test, they wanted to estimate how much energy was released. And they put up a whole bunch of markers and measurements and stuff and counters and stuff to do it. But then you have the famous story of, I think it was Fermi on the day of the explosion, sat there with pieces of paper. And as the blast wave came past, he had his watch and he dropped the pieces of paper. And um, he went later on and he just watched how far the shockwave took them. And from that, he actually managed to calculate the total energy released in the explosion up to, to an accuracy of, I think, 10%. He was less than 10% out. So, and then it took them basically three or four months to collect the rest of the data and to put in the computer and to actually calculate it like rigorously. Um, so, in fact, I mean, he knew about shockwaves, right? Um, and it gives you an idea of the power of that type of argument that you can actually do with such a simple experiment, get an idea of the shockwave. So I actually wanted to do that for Beirut as well. I mean, Beirut is interesting because it's a half... I mean, you have the shockwave up in the sky. You have the shockwave that blew out the crater. So it's a shockwave traveling through different medium. Um, and then you have the shockwave that traveled along the surface. And you have the story of cars jumping three stories high. And that's simply this basically energy impulse that was going through. And it, if it hits it wrong, then it shoots it up. Um, so, not that I want to see this type of thing happen often on Earth, but when it does happen, it's, it's, it's a fascinating study in mathematics. <laughs> okay.
Another shockwave that I'm particularly fond of is what happens when stars explode. And shockwaves, I said they become circular. It doesn't always happen that way. There's usually a high degree of symmetry, and there's reasons. There, there, there are things that actually describe how the shock front evolves, and we got the one, the speed, that tends to make it circular. It doesn't always happen, in the, especially in the beginning part of an explosion. Any small variation is amplified initially, and then it starts circularizing. And so what this picture is, it's a picture of Eta Carina. It's one of the most, it's actually visible from the southern hemisphere. It was one of the fav my favorite things to look at at Boyden. So before they put the instruments on the big telescope at Boyden, I actually could, I, w I was one of the operators there, and I went and looked at it at night and stuff. And it was really difficult to find, but the big telescope actually made it a beautiful thing to look at. Um, so anyway, this is the... The, the basically the shock wave of the planetary nebula. What happens is when your sun goes through its cycle, it burns um, hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon, goes all the way up. When it gets to iron, it can no longer get energy out. And then, but the thing is that every time the it chooses a new type of fuel, the star collapses, but some of the outer envelope starts drifting away. Okay, and so you have the star collapsing, burning more different, different fuels, and then every time you have these, and initially it does nothing, they, these like thin veils of gas that have moved away. And then what happens is once you've gone past iron, the whole star collapses, it bounces off um, the central part that's basically an iron core, and basically shoots out, and it shoots out with a tremendous amount of energy. And then the this, this shockwave literally that's shooting out, um, you wouldn't see normally, except that it then starts colliding in those big envelopes of gas that are outside. And the moment it does that, it gives us the spectacular type of light. So you could sort of see the various layers of gas that are here. This is the central explosion that's taking place. So that's, that's where the picture comes from. And actually by looking at the speed with which it travels, because the gas is so diffuse, you can start learning things about the gas, the, the history basically of the star, because it's now hitting into all the things that it sent out earlier on. Um, shock, another shock wave that makes quite a bang. Um, whenever you go through the sound barrier, what it is, what's it, 330 meters per second in air, you have the sonic boom. Um, and you don't have just one, you have other ones, a higher, you, you, can, you have the first bang that's really large, but you have, the, if you go even faster, you can, you can get other things. And what it is basically is the characteristics of your fluid equation that that speed is basically pushed together and then you go through them and you actually change the nature of a partial differential equation when you do that. Um, and that we'll see when we look at second order equations. It's actually not possible, this, this particular one is not possible in first order equations, but what is, well, the, the changing of the nature of the equation is not possible in first order equations. The colliding of characteristics is. Okay. And so what's happening here is you're physically changing the nature of the equation. You know, like when a boat travels in the water, you can see the front actually runs away from the boat before the boat gets there. Okay, so that's, the, that's an example um, of where the boat is actually influencing the f going forward. When you go through the, the sound barrier, the front part of the boat is no longer pushing forward, is no longer communicating forward, everything is back. And so what you see over here is that point of the plane that um, is now completely with the, all characteristics are bunched up there and it pushes back. And you can see the shock front then propagates away from the thing that actually caused it. It's kind of a beautiful, a beautiful photograph of that. Another shock front, and this is actually what led to a large, in large case, the understanding of how the shock propagates is when we want to control the shock front. Um, and this is an example of a, oh, sorry, explosive lens. So the big problem when they were designing the atomic bomb was to get the um, 
the explosion to actually take place that then pushes the uranium into each other. So the uranium core that was kind of separated so that it wouldn't explode in the plane or wherever else. And then to, to assemble the bomb, you physically had an explosion with ordinary explosive. Um, and that would then squash the uranium core together and that would cause the thermonuclear explosion. And the problem was how to squash it together uniformly, right? Because typically what happens in an explosion like this is initially it's ununiform and then you don't have the best detonation. So this is an example of a non-uniform explosion. So it was interesting, the, tech, the problem was faced both in America and in Russia that, uh, that was designing the thing. And the Americans solved it by hey, um, using the first numerical computer that was applied, actually just try and solve that problem and to find the way of how you should make the explosive so that the shock is circular. Um, the uh, Russians didn't have a computer. They had a very brilliant physicist, I think called Zaldovich, um, and he actually found an analytic solution. Okay, and that analytic solution we've used subsequently to describe a lot of the stars and do other explosions. But anyway, the basic idea is that the, you can influence the shock speed by the size of the jump, okay? And you can influence the size of the jump by, in some sense, the density or the type of explosive, okay? So you can think that if you have a shock wave traveling, if it's more like syrup, it's going to travel slower and there's going to be a, slow, a smaller jump than if it's traveling through, say, air, okay? And that's what they did initially, is you had two points where you detonate it with just an ordinary detonator, then your shock run forms and it basically makes circles ar around these two points. And then you want to change this um, uh, concave circle basically into something that's convex and eventually uh, goes into the sphere. And the way they did it is they had an explosive that was effectively in which the shock front traveled slowly, so it retarded this first part of the wave and then it allowed these other, the other part of the shock wave to basically catch up. Um, and then eventually it became spherical in here and then it allowed for a good detonation. So it's a very clever construction. I mean, I hope it's, in astrophysics it's now used for a good application in bomb, I'm, I'm not a great one for building bombs. Uh, but it's really cool physics of how, understanding how it works. I mean, you get shock f 